Paul said, I'm going to talk about uh, employment status under the Equality Act. And as we all know, the concept in the discrimination context is uh, quite a lot broader than it is in uh, the ERA. Um, but the question uh, obviously arises as to, well, how broad is the concept? We all know it's not uh, unlimited. And uh, my paper and uh, also the talk, if uh, there's time, will uh, address the answer to that question in four contexts which have been looked at uh, recently in the case law. Um, the first uh, of those is uh, the meaning of the concept employment under a con contract personally to do any work under Section 83 of the Equality Act. So that's the key provision which makes discrimination uh, employment status rather broader than uh, employment status in other contexts. Oh, wonderful. Um, the second uh, theme is uh, contract worker claims um, and the relationship to EU law. And uh, there's been a recent case, uh, Halawi and World Duty Free, which raised the issue as to whether the contract worker uh, gateway for bringing a claim under the discrimination legislation uh, was compatible with EU law. The third theme uh, looks at illegality and there have been some very recent developments there on uh, when illegality can act as an effective defence to a discrimination claim and then the final uh, theme is the status of volunteers uh, under the act uh, following the case which Paul mentioned ex and mid Sussex uh, CAB. So looking uh, at the first of those topics then, um, section uh, 83 is a provision we've all looked at uh, very many times, but I always think it's good to go back to that because it's always got to be our starting point. So section 83 says employment means uh, employment under a contract of employment, a contract of apprenticeship, or, and the key concept here in bold, is a contract personally to do any work. It goes on to look at various other um, types, but the key concept there is contract personally to do any work. And... Uh, employee and employer obviously to be construed accordingly. So the two key words in that bold uh, provision, firstly contract, um, it goes that saying that the uh, claimant has to work under a contract with the person in this context that they're claiming against. Secondly the contract has to provide for them to provide work personally um, rather than uh, to provide it uh, via some sort of substitution. Um, but it's been the case for a long while under um, the predecessor provisions that it's not enough, perhaps surprisingly, to show that somebody worked under a contract and that they uh, undertook under that contract to do the work personally. Um, in the old uh, case law, it also was necessary to consider whether the dominant purpose of the contract under which uh, that person worked was the execution of personal work or labour or something else. That's the quote from Mirror Group newspapers. And in that case, uh, the purpose of the contract under which the claimant worked was uh, the supply and distribution of newspapers and uh, not the execution of personal work. So uh, for that reason, uh, a claim could have been brought under the discrimination uh, legislation. So that dominant purpose test overlaid on the uh, statutory test uh, was in force for a long time uh, until the Supreme Court had cause to re-examine uh, the Section 83 provision in uh, Jivraj and Hashwani um, almost exactly three years ago. That case concerned uh, an agreement which provided for the appointment of an arbitrator and the agreement specified that the arbitrator uh, to be appointed had to be a member of a particular religious community. The question arose, uh, would an arbitrator being appointed or not being appointed under that uh, provision be uh, protected under the legislation? Um, the Court of Appeal uh, looked at the legislation quite literally and said, plainly, an arbitrator would have a contract um, and plainly they would be obliged under that contract to work personally because the arbitrator would have been personally selected and um, the other part of the contract would obviously expect that arbitrator to personally turn up to provide uh, the services. 
And again, perhaps surprisingly, the Court of Appeal uh, said, well, we accept that that might uh, broaden the scope of uh, employment status under the Equality Act. It might mean that a solicitor or a plumber or a doctor um, being appointed might be able to bring a claim. And that's um, perhaps surprising and, and news to the rest of us. And the Supreme Court obviously had um, quite a degree of discomfort uh, with that um, proposal. And they started off by saying, well, the appointment of an arbitrator isn't naturally described uh, as employment at all. Um, applying a sort of know-it-when-we-see-it test, an arbitrator doesn't seem to us uh, to be an employee, even in the broad uh, context of discrimination law. So looking to uh, find support for that position, they turned to the European definition of worker under the uh, well-known Allenby case. And uh, the test under that for worker status was uh, a worker uh, is someone providing services for and under the direction of another person in return for remuneration. Someone who's not a worker, uh, the contrasting position is somebody who's an independent provider of services who is not in a relationship of subordination. And from that, uh, said the Supreme Court, the key concept is uh, subordination. The dominant purpose test applied under the old law might be relevant to determining whether there's a relationship of subordination. On the other hand, it might not be the whole story. Um, when precisely is the relationship of subordination? Well, said the Supreme Court, that's a broad question which will depend on the circumstances of the case. Um, so that old chestnut, perhaps not uh, terribly helpful uh, to us when we're looking to, to advise or litigate. So moving on from that, the, case, the uh, same question was considered uh, last year in CVS Solicitors and Vanderborg. Um, so the claimant in that case was a former partner of the firm who'd subsequently entered into a consultancy arrangement uh, he had no minimum hours. He was paid by commission. Um, he did have uh, administrative facilities uh, with the respondent and he was uh, expected to comply uh, with their rules. Question arose, can he bring a claim under Section 83? Well, clearly, um, there's a contract in place, albeit a consultancy contract. Clearly, uh, personal service would be required of him. He couldn't send somebody... Uh, in his place. The key question then was always going to be, was there a relationship here of subordination? The tribunal approached this case by looking at the degree of integration um, there was and how integrated the claimant was in the respondent's organisation. And they said, we find there's a significant degree of integration here and we find that that's indicative of a relationship of subordination. So the case went to the EAT um, and the ground of appeal was uh, that the judge had got it wrong in considering the test, the integration test, whereas what they should have done was look uh, specifically at subordination. No, said the EAT, the judge got it right. Integration is uh, one of the relevant circumstances of the case. That's what Jivraj uh, tells us to look at. And on the contrary, the judge would have been wrong if they hadn't looked at uh, the question of integration because plainly it was a relevant circumstance. So where does that leave us in terms of uh, applying Section 83? Um, clearly, Givraj tells us subordination is the key test. How do we determine whether subordination is present or not? Well, we can look at dominant purpose. It, it may or may not be relevant. Um, we should look at integration, says the EAT in Vanderborg. Um, that will give us a, an indication as to whether there's a relationship of subordination. But ultimately, going back to Givraj, we've got to look at all the circumstances of the case. So for us as advisors and litigators, it's going to be necessary to go beyond those tests go deep down into the evidence and see what can we find that points either in favour of subordination uh, as, a, as a concept as a whole or against it. Um, 
Another relevant case on subordination and a recent case is Halawi and World Duty Free. Now, that uh, case saw an attempt to argue that subordination uh, is a concept that uh, encompasses the notion of economic dependency as well as a, a kind of relationship of control. And we'll come on to that in a moment, but it's necessary to rewind a bit before we look at uh, Halawi and uh, because it was a contract worker case. So the claim was brought uh, under Section 41, not Section 83. So we need to go back and look at the various components of Section 41, first of all. So Section 41, dealing with contract workers, um, the paradigm case under Section 41 is an agency agreement, a tripartite agency agreement, where somebody is employed by one body but does work in practice on a day-to-day -day basis for another. And, of course, the, per the likely source of any discrimination is going to be um, where that person uh, works rather than who they're employed by. So that's the uh, general thrust of Section 41, uh, which provides a principal must not discriminate against a contract worker. A principal is a person who makes work available for an individual who is, A, employed by another person and be supplied by that other person in furtherance of a contract to which the principal is a party, whether or not that other person is a party to it and a contract worker is the individual supplied. So, first thing to note, um, subsection 5A incorporates the concept of employed by another person. Of course, that's employed in the section 83 sense. So, in a conventional tripartite arrangement, you would expect to see the worker being uh, an employee under Section 83 of the agency in order to be able to bring a claim against the principal, i.e. the end user. Um, and the other part, point to note is what's set out uh, explicitly in 5b. So it's not necessarily limited to these tripartite arrangements. It could be that the end user has a contract with somebody else who subsequently contracts with the agency, who subsequently contracts with the individual, it might be more complex, in short, than the tripartite relationship. And that was certainly uh, true on the facts of uh, Halawi and World Duty Free, which you can see from my um, splendid diagram here. Um, so the facts of this case were as follows. Mrs Halawi um, worked in the World Duty Free counter in Heathrow Airport. She um, was selling... Uh, cosmetics uh, manufactured by the company called Shiseido and she was she wore the Shiseido uniform she was on the concession in the duty-free stand she was using World Duty Free's uh, tills and she was subject to their um, to the to the rules they applied to all the concessionaries on their premises so if you were rushing off on your holiday to somewhere sunny and warm from Heathrow you pass through to buy some cosmetics from Mrs Halawi you might think if you were thinking about those things on your way to your holiday, that uh, she would be someone able to bring a claim uh, under the Equality Act. Um, she looks, she's somebody who works in a shop, she's plainly uh, not there on her own account. Um, we might presume, um, if we were thinking about these things, that she would be able to bring a claim. Not so, um, said the tribunal and said the EAT. It was necessary to go back and look the web of arrangements under which she actually worked. So we've got Mrs Halawi down the bottom, the claimant. She uh, had, under advice, created a personal services company, No Had Limited, who in turn contracted uh, with an agency, CSA, who were responsible for providing salespeople under their agreement with Shiseido. Shiseido ultimately contracted with uh, world duty free, providing the cosmetics and the workers that they had sourced through CSA to work on the world duty free stand. So Mrs. Halawi had this complex contractual arrangement in place, um, albeit where she actually worked on a day to day basis was world duty free. And so unsurprisingly, her complaint um, was against their actions um, in withdrawing uh, her airside pass. Um, which she said was both unfair and discriminatory. 
question arises, can she bring a claim? Um, initially, she brought an unfair dismissal claim, a claim under Section 83 against World Duty Free, and her contract worker claim. And um, unsurprisingly, she wasn't held to be uh, an employee of World Duty Free because she had no contract directly with them. And the same uh, point uh, scuppered her Section 83 claim. Um, so the question remained, could she bring uh, a claim under Section 41 as a contract worker? Now, the problem uh, here, as uh, the tribunal and the EAT saw it, was that although the relationship between uh, Mrs. Salawi and her uh, personal services company wasn't uh, sufficiently uh, explored in the evidence, it was clear that there was a right of substitution. Mrs. Salawi could send along somebody uh, to do the work in her place if she so chose, and perhaps unusually again, she in fact had exercised that right in the past. So what the claimant said was, well, the requirement for personal service under the uh, Equality Act is not uh, compatible with the test under EU law. The relevant test, said the claimant, was the worker test in Allenby, which we looked at a moment ago uh, in um, Givraj, and a particular uh, passage in that, uh, which said that it wasn't necessary to look at the contractual uh, relationships or the legal relationships, but actually the reality of the situation. And also said the claimant, subordination uh, is about economic dependency. Um, the claimant said, I'm on an economically dependent relationship with World Duty Free because ultimately I only work for them and they're, uh, they're the ones who pay me, albeit by circuitous route, and they're the ones who have the power to control whether I work there or not. Those arguments were rejected. The EAT said it's not necessary to disregard the wording of the statute and it is necessary to look at the uh, contractual setup. Um, and interestingly, for the purposes of the um, of working out when we've got a relationship of subordination or not, the EAT said when considering the Allenby test, i.e. subordination, the tribunal should be, quote, looking to control the flip side of which, in large part, is subordination. So what can we glean from uh, Halawi? Firstly, um, appearances aren't everything. Um, we need to go back and look at the contractual matrix. And secondly, it tells us a bit more about what we're looking at when we're applying the subordination test, um, in that according uh, to the EAT here, control is a key part of uh, subordination, in that it's in large part the flip side of it. So looking at uh, Halawi, that case uh, is... Uh, being appealed to the Court of Appeal, I understand that the EAT and uh, Court of Appeal uh, refused permission, uh, but that permission is going to be renewed at an oral hearing. So we may see further developments uh, with Halawi, and uh, the claimant in particular wants to pursue the point that um, the domestic provisions are, are incompatible with EU law. Um, so that remains to be seen whether that will... Uh, be borne out. Um, one observation on that, though, is this. What the claimant was saying in that case was subordination doesn't just mean control, it means economic dependency. But if we go right back to the um, relevant quote in Allenby, it's clear that the contrast was between uh, people working under the control and direction of another, as opposed to somebody who was uh, not in a subordinate relationship. So it seems to me that the EU law doesn't consider subordination to be a question of economic dependency. It's more about control um, and power of direction in a, in, a, in a somewhat narrower sense. Moving on to the um, third uh, topic that I want to look at, and that's illegality. So... The basic principle um, remains that in Hall and Wollstone Hall Leisure, which we've all looked at many times, um, 
it is uh, potentially possible for a discrimination claim to be defeated by a defence of illegality, and whether or not it can be is dependent on the test uh, as set out as follows. So it's, the question is whether the applicant's claim arises out of or is so clearly connected or inextricably linked with the illegal conduct of the applicant that the court could not permit the applicant to recover compensation without appearing to condone that conduct. So there has to be a close connection or an inextricable uh, link before the defence will succeed. And it's also clear from this quote that the focus has to be on the conduct of the applicant, um, of, so of the claimant uh, as an individual, um, and not the fo on the illegal conduct, if there is any, on the part of the employer. So some cases which uh, have uh, considered the illegality defence First of all, uh, Vacante, which is a, quite a straightforward case. In that case, there was uh, a teacher who misled uh, the school he was applying to work for as to uh, his right to work in this country. Um, he uh, never ultimately got the appropriate uh, permit. The school uh, didn't know anything about this, so it wasn't party to the illegality. Could the school rely on the illegality defence? Yes, said the Court of Appeal, um, the whole claim by the claimant was predicated on his being present in the UK illegally and he was solely culpable. So the illegality defence succeeded there. Um, slightly um, more complex facts in uh, the more recent case of Hunger and Allen. In that case, uh, the claimant uh, had conspired with the respondent to enter the country uh, illegally and under false pretenses so that she could come and work as a um, domestic servant and um, then complained of um, quite serious mistreatment and ultimately dismissal at their hands. Um, the claims that didn't relate to dismissal were knocked out at an earlier stage um, because uh, they fell foul of the grievance um, provisions then in force. So the issue before the Court of Appeal was whether the claimant could claim, uh, bring a claim for a discriminatory dismissal under the uh, discrimination legislation. And the Court of Appeal, uh, unlike the EAT, said no, she couldn't. So the, uh, the way the uh, EAT approached it um, was that the illegal conduct of the respondent in uh, ending the claimant's employment was a world away from the claimant's illegal conduct in having entered the country in the first place. No, said the Court of Appeal, that's the wrong approach. The fact that the respondent uh, has acted unlawfully doesn't um, put the claimant in any better position. She acted unlawfully and knowingly unlawfully. Um, so that should be the focus of the inquiry. And yes, there was an inextricable link, uh, said the Court of Appeal, because um, she was relying on her special vulnerability as somebody who is in the country illegally uh, in order to um, make good her discrimination claims. For that reason, they said the inextricable link was present and uh, she couldn't uh, pursue her claim. Um, now, that uh, case has uh, this week been... Uh, heard in the Supreme Court. So um, as to whether that remains the test or not, uh, watch this space. Um, but clearly, um, if the uh, claimant in that case is going to be able to pursue her uh, claim that her dismissal was discriminatory, there's going to have to be quite a fundamental change in the approach uh, taken in the uh, Hall case, which has uh, stood the test of time until now. Um, Meanwhile, there's been an EAT case uh, considering the question of uh, illegality. Um, we're back at Heathrow Airport again, hotbed of employment law. Um, and this case uh, concerned a uh, foreign national who'd applied for a job with uh, the respondent and some time uh, passed before she actually began her employment. And she attended a series of meetings uh, before she uh, actually took up the employment um, in which she was um, 
alleging that she'd been uh, harassed and assaulted. Um, there was illegality from the point of commencement of employment because she had told the respondent that she needed her work permits transferred to them for her employment to be lawful and that had never in fact occurred until after the events complained of. And this case um, is instructive to us because it shows the value in considering the case not uh, as a homogenous claim but it shows us that we need to look at the individual um, matters complained of to see whether the illegality defence um, can be made good or not. So the EAT said, first of all, the acts that occurred before the claimant commenced employment uh, weren't tainted by illegality because the illegality only uh, arose once employment started. Uh, and in that period, furthermore, she um, could rely on the provisions uh, which protect applicants for employment from discrimination. So the illegality defence didn't bite there at all. As to what happened during her employment, at the end of her employment, there was a difference, said the EAT, between her complaints about harassment and her complaints about dismissal. Although the, uh, her employment status had given uh, the opportunity for harassment to take place, um, that didn't uh, suffice as an uh, inexplicable, uh, sorry, an inextricable um, link in that opportunity wasn't sufficient. Harassment isn't a necessary or obvious uh, consequence of employment. It can occur in other contexts and therefore her harassment claims could uh, proceed. Dismissal was a different matter. Dismissal by its nature is the ending of an employment contract which she shouldn't have uh, by rights had at all. So dismissal did um, establish that inextricable link and the illegality defence there um, succeeded. So she was left with claims uh, before her employment commenced and complaints about what happened during it. Um, whether that uh, remains good law will, I think, largely depend on what happens in the Supreme Court in Hunga. But again, it's a case of watch this space. Um, the uh, final topic which I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the status of volunteers under the Equality Act. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, please uh, read that section at your leisure in my paper. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the article. It's the top of it.